Welcome. I'm really pleased that you've come to join me today. And uh, my name is Bill Reddy. I am a board certified licensed acupuncturist and I've been practicing for uh, more than 20 years here in the US. And uh, I am a former aerospace engineer and uh, I also uh, worked on master's degrees in robotics and systems engineering. And I was misdiagnosed with a brain tumor when I was 26 and I thought I was going to die. And it made me stop and reevaluate my life and realized that I thought that traditional Chinese medicine was just a better fit for me. And so I changed careers and, uh, and now I work at Innova Hospital System in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, I've also been quite involved in promoting acupuncture in the United States and was the president of the Acupuncture Society of Virginia. I held a position as the director of the AMA of acupuncture here called the uh, American Association of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. And now I'm uh, the director of the Integrative Health Policy Consortium. And we represent about uh, 650,000 practitioners across the nation. And that includes chiropractors and massage therapists, naturopaths and homeopaths, certified professional midwives, nutritionists, holistic nurses, and integrative physicians. And so we uh, work on the Hill. I do uh, congressional briefings. We created an integrative health and wellness caucus, which uh, is, is designed to educate legislators on, uh, on integrative medicine. And hopefully we can change how uh, medicine is performed here in the United States. So um, I see that the, it says acupuncture treatment for peripheral neuropathy. I do apologize for that. I was modifying uh, a lecture that I gave. So this is introduction to traditional Chinese medicine. So what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the history of acupuncture in the US, a little bit about the practice, the education, frequently asked questions. I'm gonna do a little bit over research. And at the end, I'm gonna have about 20 minutes where I can answer any questions about specific ailments that you are interested in knowing whether acupuncture or herbal medicine is um, appropriate to treat these conditions. And throughout, like Arena said, is that if you have any questions, you can click, uh, put up your hand, and I will see the hand uh, being waved, and uh, I'll answer those questions. So some of the frequently asked questions that I've had are, well, does that, what does it feel like? Does it hurt? What conditions will it treat? What can I expect in a treatment? Will my insurance cover acupuncture? That's a big one. What are the needles made of? Is there a license required to practice? What is herbology? So if someone could type in the chat box when, when acupuncture was first introduced in the United States, what year you think that uh, acupuncture was uh, uh, gained popularity or, or began here in the US. Anyone, anyone, Bueller? I see 1944, I see 1968. Ooh, 1896, going for the low one, 50. 1830, wow. 1808, okay. So I'll, I'll uh, spill my guts and say that it actually began with the Transcontinental Railroad and that there were quite a few uh, Chinese laborers that were working. And uh, that was really the first time that, uh, that acupuncture was being used in the United States but it wasn't as if they were hanging up a shingle and practicing formally. They just had access to needles and they were treating people. It really wasn't until uh, 
that back in, in 1971, actually, um, Nixon uh, went to uh, Be uh, Peking, which is now Beijing, uh, China, and uh, he was talking some trade things, that kind of thing. And there was a uh, uh, there was a reporter there from the New York Times. His name was James Reston. And uh, James ended up coming down with acute appendicitis and he uh, needed emergency surgery. So instead of flying back to the US, he had surgery in uh, China. And, and post-surgery back then, when you had anesthesia, you tended to have some nausea associated with, the, with, with that. And so they brought in an acupuncturist. He told them that he was feeling pretty nauseous, like he was going to throw up and had, had some quite a bit of pain abdominally. And so uh, the acupuncturist uh, put three needles in, one uh, on his leg, et cetera. And within 15 minutes, his nausea vanished and he felt considerably better. And he wrote an article that made it in the New York Times about his experience with acupuncture. So that was really the first time in the US that um, the Americans were aware of acupuncture. And since that time in the early 1980s, there were national organizations that had developed and we started to have formal schools in the country. So, um, as far as uh, the number of schools we have, we have 60 schools in the country uh, that are currently uh, accredited. As far as uh, number of years required, uh, we do four years of undergrad. And then if you do not go into pre-med, you, uh, you can do a year of medical prerequisites, which is what I did. And then three years of school for acupuncture. If you study herbology, it's two additional years of didactic training and then a year of internship. So it's fairly, um, you know, it's fairly comprehensive. And uh, the clinical requirements, we have about 500 hours that are required for um, um, kind of observation, clinical observation, and then um, a year of uh, of actual internship. And the degree that's conferred 20 years ago was just the master's degree. But now we do have doctoral level degrees similar to that of physical therapists. Are there any questions at this time before I move on? I don't see any. Okay. So people ask, well, what conditions does it treat? Well, internally, things like hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, got asthma, high blood pressure. You can see that there's quite a bit of digestive issues like diarrhea and constipation, and even uh, things, the endocrinology, uh, like, uh, like diabetes. Uh, ear, nose, and throat, uh, we've got deafness, but that's sudden uh, sensory neural type deafness. There's some people that are exposed to very loud sounds, like um, if they're in the aviation industry, uh, military types that have been around a lot of explosions, that can cause a deafness that acupuncture cannot treat. You see ringing in the ears or tinnitus, that's something we do treat but the uh, outcomes are kind of poor, actually. Um, I get about a 20% response rate. So maybe one out of five people will get better. Um, the literature demonstrates about that as well, about the 20% response rate. You see dizziness and vertigo is something that I treat. And uh, in many cases, for those of you who do have dizziness on this call, that um, it can be due to your medication. And certainly I would discuss it with your physician about what medications you're on that have a side effect of dizziness. It's one of the major reasons for uh, falls in uh, our senior community. And again, you can see sinus infections, sore throat, hay fever. And just as a side for the hay fever, uh, also known as allergic rhinitis, 
I actually got involved with an otolaryngology panel for allergic rhinitis, where we had 22 MDs and myself, and we created a clinical guideline that goes out to the country. So uh, I was asked, are there studies that show effectiveness of acupuncture for various ailments? At NIH, the National Institutes of Health, National Library of Medicine, uh, there's about uh, 35,000 studies on acupuncture. And with traditional Chinese medicine, it includes the herbal medicine component, there's about 65,000 studies. So yes, we're very, very well studied. And when I get into uh, some of the research, I'll talk about some common conditions like osteoarthritis, what percentage we get uh, for improvement. Again, you can see musculoskeletal. Most people know that acupuncture is good for pain, whether it's arthritis or something neurological, neuralgias, sciatica. Um, you always have the aunt that says, oh, it's my sciatica. Well, sciatica is uh, the compression of a pathway of a nerve in which one of the largest nerves in your body that uh, starts at your lower spine and runs down your leg to your foot. And if it's compressed in some way, either through a disc herniation or uh, through uh, spinal stenosis, that that will cause pain. That's something acupuncture can treat. You see Bell's palsy, trigeminal neuralgia, which I've seen a lot of patients, and that's definitely no fun, very, very painful condition. Um, cerebral palsy is something that uh, typically acupuncturists that specialize in neurological conditions will treat. Since um, my patients are unaware that, um, that acupuncture treats cerebral palsy and polio, I've literally had zero patients in the past 20 years with those conditions. You can see on the right, you've got impotence and infertility, you've got PMS, vaginitis, morning sickness is something that has been referred to for acupuncture for years about its effectiveness. And I used to work with Life with Cancer here at Innova, and we uh, treat symptoms associated with cancer treatment, which includes nausea due to chemotherapy. Acupuncture is very, very effective at that, as well as things like uh, peripheral neuropathy, which can also be from chemo. You have hot flashes due to hormonal therapies. There's joint aches due to aromatase inhibitors. Uh, there's xerostomia, which is a dry mouth chronic dry mouth due to head and neck cancer radiation that I deal with. So uh, when I mentioned about my training, I forgot to mention that about 40% of my training is Western medicine, which means that I learned anatomy and physiology and pathology and virology and bacteriology. Um, so we do learn quite a bit of Western medicine, but if that were a whole curricula, then there would be MD after my name. So I am not an MD. Uh, in Virginia, we're considered LAC or licensed acupuncturists. In New Mexico, we would be considered an OMD or a doctor of oriental medicine. In uh, Florida, we are AP or acupuncture physicians. So I would be doctor ready in New Mexico and in Florida, but here in Virginia, I um, am just, just Bill. You can see under mental, emotional, you've got anxiety and depression, stress and insomnia, of which I treat quite a bit of those in Northern Virginia, just because you know, it's a highly stressed area. And then infections such as cold and flu, flu, bronchitis, hepatitis. And there are some protocols that we use not only to treat COVID, but also long COVID conditions. Dermatologically, things like eczema and acne and herpes can be treated. Uh, psoriasis is something that's very stubborn and um, it can be treated, but it's not easy. 
any questions about the uh, conditions that I treat? Yes, that and is again, Bob, oh, please. Bob, could you un unmute yourself? Yeah, Bob, higher. Uh, I had a question, uh, Bill. Is acupuncture actually um, cutting off a response from a, a position to the brain? Is that what it does? Uh, it, it cuts off that communications? Um, I appreciate that question. In Western medicine, they do have something called RF or radio frequency ablation. And if someone has chronic low back pain that they can actually fry the nerve that sends that sensory signal to mm -hmm. the brain. In my opinion, that's like having a house that's on fire and you shutting off the smoke detector. So no, in fact, acupuncture does not block the nerves and that uh, what it does is if you have an inflammatory condition, it reduces the inflammation associated with that, similar to a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, there's uh, people who um, have uh, neurological pain, a pain due to a compressed nerve, and uh, I can help with that as well. So yes, it's not blocking the pain. It's actually- uh, I mean, it's, healing. it's like, Sciatica, I got a, a uh, bump on the butt, which resulted in that sciatic nerve. And every five years for about four months, it would come back for about 20, uh, 25 years. And, and now it's, it's not back. But is that something that uh, you say you can uh, cure or help, if you will, not cure, but help uh, relieve the pain? Uh, absolutely. And uh, one of the mechanisms, which we'll be talking about mechanisms a little bit later in this lecture, is, um, is that uh, there's endogenous opioids, which are very powerful um, pain relieving chemicals that our brain produces, and that acupuncture stimulates the production of those of those chemicals. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, so someone asked about uh, my experience in treating POTS and dysautonomia. The answer is uh, it's, it's kind of a rare condition, so I haven't seen it that much clinically. So no, I don't feel super confident in treating those. I apologize for that. And uh, there's a note from Judy who said uh, she tried uh, acupuncture for peripheral neuropathy and it didn't help. Um, would you suggest a different person who might have a different technique? Certainly. So um, I've got quite a bit of experience with peripheral neuropathies and it can be driven by a number of things, including diabetes. And so depending on uh, the general health of the person, there are techniques that include uh, electro uh, acupuncture um, as opposed to just body acupuncture where you would clip uh, electricity to the needles and have a particular frequency that goes into those needles. Um, what I would recommend, Judy, for you is there's a product called Neuropaway, and I would get your pause on that and give that a try for eight to 12 weeks. And that uh, Neuropaway contains things like B12. Most of the time, people who have nerve conditions are low in vitamin B12. And it also contains um, uh, ALA, alpha lipoic acid, which is also very good for nerve conduction. And so those things could be helpful to you. Edward said uh, uh, post-op pain, yes. So um, we have quite a bit of literature on uh, post-operative pain and that acupuncture is used in, in the top 10 hospital systems in the country. So Johns Hopkins University, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Harvard, all have acupuncturists in various uh, departments. We're trying as a nation to get, uh, to get acupuncture in, um, in emergency rooms. But uh, for instance, at Johns Hopkins, we're used in uh, post-operatively. So that would be the uh, uh, the orthopedics department in um, in uh, the cancer department and also in GI up north. I'm talking about in Baltimore. Let's see, 
Um, does acupuncture treat diabetes or the negative symptoms of diabetes? The answer is yes. Um, again, I don't have a whole lot of uh, clinical experience with that just because um, people don't know that it can affect diabetes. So I just haven't um, had that. But there are uh, acupuncturists that specialize in endocrinology. And Bonnie said, does acupuncture stimulate dopamine, which uh, I read when as low as night can cause restless leg syndrome. So yes, acupuncture does treat restless leg syndrome and that we can impact uh, neurotransmitters that include dopamine. Any other questions before I move on? Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. I uh, guess I was asking if you could um, kind of run through the procedure for treating blood pressure. Uh, certainly. So, um, so there are a bunch of different things that drive hypertension. You can have atherosclerosis, which is uh, fatty deposits in your arteries. You can have arteriosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries. You can have uh, an imbalance of electrolytes in your body caused by your kidney that will raise your blood pressure. Uh, so uh, when it comes to essential uh, hypertension or primary hypertension, uh, that acupuncture is quite good at controlling the blood vessels that uh, sometimes will constrict and that will raise blood pressure. So if you look at some blood pressure medications, some of them are diuretics and they cause you to urinate, which will reduce blood volume. You have some drugs that block that control of squeezing of the blood vessels and that's where acupuncture is most effective. There's also you, herbal, you, oh, go on. Uh, I'm just saying, could you uh, give an, an idea of the success rate in treating uh, lowering blood pressure significantly? Uh, that's a good question. You know, that the, uh, the, the literature varies depending on what type of blood pressure uh, control it is. Um, I find that herbal medicine tends to work better and uh, that, that short term acupuncture has a good short term effect on high blood pressure. But when you stop getting the treatments, it tends to come back. That's my understanding. Would, would a, blood, a, a blood pressure patient who is taking prescribed medication, would that person stop taking it to get the when they go through acupuncture treatment? So if, if you were working with an acupuncturist, then they would work with your physician to slowly get you off of your medication in, in a controlled manner. It's outside of our scope of practice to, uh, uh, to change the drugs that you're on. Uh, only physicians or sometimes uh, licensed practical nurses can do these things. So uh, yeah, yeah, success rate, any, any uh, comment on success rate? Um, 10%, so, uh, 50%? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I haven't really dug in the literature to give you an exact number. I, I apologize for that. I tend okay. to, um, I, I focus on uh, orthopedics and GI. And so that's the, the primary patients that come see me. <clears throat> and I see a question about, uh, do the treatments have a long-term effects like for IBS? The answer is yes. Uh, the acupuncture can treat IBS. Um, however, in my opinion, there is usually a problem with the microbiome or the good bacteria located in your small intestine. And until you address that, that can be a problem. The second thing to look into uh, is there's a test called the lactulose mannitol test. It is a urine test that you would do. And that would check to see if you have hyperpermeability of your small intestine that can trigger IBS. So as most people know, IBS is considered an autoimmune disorder. And so, uh, so until you can address that autoimmune component, then you're not gonna deal with the symptom very well. So acupuncture- Could I ask help. a question? Please. Um, I'm interested in, in, in finding out in, in 
Western medicine, a number of pre-tests are done to unfold a diagnosis at, of, a, of some neurological condition. Um, how, how does it work in terms of pre-testing um, in acupuncture or how do you determine um, a, a particular diagnosis like a, a neuropathy? Uh, that's a great question. And um, that's coming up uh, later on in my presentation. And uh, it, it, someone did say, can we continue the presentation? Because I, I want about 20 minutes at the end for, to ask about specific health conditions. So I, I will have that. Um, someone asked, is dry needling a form of acupuncture? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's something that's called uh, the, uh, the turtle probes the sand. And that's a very specific technique that doesn't involve knowledge of acupuncture meridians, but rather the neuromuscular junction of a muscle that when you hit it, it will fasciculate or twitch and will release that muscle. So people who have terrible muscle spasms, uh, people with chronic pain who have um, these, these tender points or trigger points, uh, we can help release that. And uh, the success rate for treating sciatica is quite high. Uh, restless leg syndrome, a little bit lower. It's uh, quite a stubborn condition. So what can't acupuncture treat? So things like HIV and AIDS, pretty stubborn. Um, once you have it, you have it. Um, I can't make cancer go away in someone. However, I can increase natural killer cells in their body and NK cells are what's in your body to keep you from getting cancer. Structural problems like scoliosis, although I have spoken to a, a, an acupuncturist who said that by needling the paraspinal muscles next to the spine, that you can in fact straighten a person's spine who has scoliosis, but I have not seen that in the literature. Disc herniations, if there is a disc that's stepping on a or seven, that the little needles are not going to make that disc physically move. However, we can reduce the inflammation associated with the disc herniation, and a lot of times that can cause the pain to reduce, and eventually the disc can heal itself. Spinal stenosis is something that's very, very stubborn, and a surgical approach is necessary. Things like a deviated septum and kidney stones are other things there where herbal medicine is great and can completely dissolve kidney stones, but acupuncture can only deal with the pain associated with it. So uh, a woman was asking about diagnosis. One of the things we use is actually the tongue, the tongue diagnosis. And we look at not only the coating on the tongue, but the shape of the tongue, how the edges look. If you look at the image to your left, you can see that there's a lot of cracks, almost like in a desert mud that's dried. That person would have a chronic yin deficiency. And in Chinese medicine, a yin deficiency could present in hot flashes. It could present with uh, chronic insomnia. Um, also, like a liver yin deficiency can uh, be a contributor to uh, chronic arthritis. The, the right, which is kind of a poor uh, quality image, I apologize, uh, that you see kind of a dry yellow coating on that, and that could be someone who is recovering from bronchitis. So we use the tongue as one of our diagnostic methods. There's also pulse diagnosis, and there are three pulses on each wrist that correspond to a different organ in your body. And so the thing that's unusual about traditional Chinese medicine is the organs that you see here, spleen, kidney, heart, notice that they're capitalized. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that the heart in Chinese medicine does not have to do with the actual physical heart. So I could diagnose someone with a spleen qi deficiency and they may have had their spleen removed 20 years ago because it's not their real spleen. 
which is really unusual. And I know you're scratching your head right now, but all of the organs in Chinese medicine are conceptual. And they did, created these conceptual processes that these organs do. Like for instance, if a woman is not ovulating in Chinese medicine, she may have a kidney chi deficiency. So I'll treat a point on the inside of her ankle, kidney three, that will tonify her kidney chi in Chinese medicine. But in reality, it balances hormones like follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and then she'll start to ovulate again. So as an acupuncturist, I've got to work within this philosophical uh, framework in order to uh, get a diagnosis and then treat from there. And so that diagnosis would drive what acupoints to use and also what herbal medicine to use. Any questions on that so far? I know it's highly unusual for Americans to get it, but anyone who's Chinese in this crowd will know that um, you may say that your child has heat in their blood if they have acne. And that's just a common diagnosis. Now, uh, Americans and you know modern folks realize that your blood isn't actually hot, but that is a, um, you know, that's just one of the diagnoses and that you would give cooling herbs to help the, uh, the acne go away. Uh, John, 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 has, oh, yes? uh, John has his hand up. I, I assume that's what you were asking uh, about. John, can you, un you unmute it? Go ahead. Yes. Is there a difference in the training for acupuncture in China versus the US? Uh, that's a great question. And so I studied under people from Beijing and Shanghai medical schools. And so the curricula was very, very similar to that of, of um, the study in China. However, um, in China, you, if, if you wanna study medicine, you can go one of two routes, you can go, uh, you can go traditional Chinese medicine or you can go Western medicine. In Western medicine, you'd learn exactly what you would learn here in a typical medical school. And in traditional Chinese medicine, the first two years are, are the same, taking anatomy, physiology, et cetera. And then the second two years, that's when you would study herbal medicine and study acupuncture. And when you graduate, you would have MD after your name. Uh, also, you work in a hospital in your internship and you see significantly more patients in China. So if I trained in China when I graduated, I would have a lot more clinical experience than just the single year that I did here in the US where I was required to see maybe six patients a day, something like that. Um, I hope that answered your question. And so when people ask, well, does it hurt? Uh, the answer is the needles are, are really quite tiny. They're, they're four times the diameter of a human hair. They're stainless steel and they're used once and discarded. And so um, if you've had a mosquito bite, usually that's what an acupuncture needle feels like. However, the, the Chinese sometimes use thicker needles. They use um, their, their uh, like 30 gauge or 32 gauge and, uh, and they do hurt and, uh, and it can be quite uncomfortable. Also, some of the techniques involved with rotating the needles can also uh, be uh, a little bit on the uncomfortable side. So here's a typical acupuncture treatment. Uh, for those who uh, recognize the image that comes from, uh, from the, the uh, Matrix movie. And so uh, we're depicted in most Hollywood as having 40 or 400 needles in people. And that's just not the way we practice. And I just had a new patient this morning where I said to her, you know, the whole 40, 50 needle thing is Hollywood. And for her, I used six, I used six needles on it. And she had a number of things going on from insomnia to uh, hip pain. So that's a little bit more 
uh, more realistic. Then again, this is what the public sees, you know, lots of needles across, and that's just not really the way we practice, but, you know, it shocks the audience and uh, people, you know, my sister saw uh, sex in the city and there was an, uh, an episode where this woman wanted to, uh, she was being treated for, for uh, infertility. And the next image up on the screen, uh, she had all these needles in her face. And uh, that's nonsense. And that uh, there really aren't very many points on the face that are used for, for infertility. So once again, they're just trying to shock bodies. So many people ask, well, what can you expect in a treatment? Typically, uh, treatments last about an hour and a half for the first visit. And again, in private practice, you can do as you wish. Maybe some private practices will give you 20 minutes uh, for initial evaluation and treatment. But, uh, but if you were to come to me, it's an hour and a half. And uh, usually I have people in and out within an hour of subsequent treatments. And the needles are retained for about 20 to 30 minutes, meaning that they stay in your body for that period of time. And it sounds scary or uncomfortable, but uh, actually once the needle's in, you rarely feel anything at all. And people ask, well, well do my insurance, will my insurance cover acupuncture treatments? And you can see at the bottom, I pulled this information back from 2004, so this is very uh, old information. Um, that uh, here it says about 52% of insurance companies cover acupuncture, and this would be for Virginia, but now it's higher than that. And that um, it, uh, it's acupuncture is considered uh, an, a, uh, an essential health benefit. And uh, so in six states, there's 100% of acupuncture coverage. 100% of insurance companies cover acupuncture. And so um, states like Maryland and uh, California, New Mexico, Washington State, um, all have 100% insurance coverage. Virginia is considered the Commonwealth and uh, so not so much. And so the needles are used once and discarded here in the United States. They're made out of stainless steel. Back in uh, 1984, I believe it was, it was considered a medical device. Up until that point, you as a general citizen could buy acupuncture needles, but now you need to have a license in order to, uh, to buy needles. And so I'm licensed by the Board of Medicine in Virginia, and that's true for every other state where acupuncturists practice. In Virginia, for instance, you have to graduate from an accredited institution. There's a national board certification, which is eight hour long test that uh, a national organization called the NCCAOM, the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine creates these uh, psychometric tests to make sure that they're accurate. And they're under ICE, which is uh, Institute for Cred Credentialing Excellence. And uh, so we need a certain number of biological science credits. We need a minimum of 5,500 hours of internship. And, uh, and just in order to maintain my licensure, I need 60 hours of continuing education needs every two years. So you think, well, it's an ancient Chinese secret, but uh, we still have to learn uh, to keep on top of this. Uh, I apologize, this is 47. There's actually 47 states that, uh, that we are uh, allowed to practice. Um, we're considered primary care in five states. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think I think Oklahoma is now has a practice act, and uh, I think North Dakota and South Dakota are still standoffs. They're still not. And I think Wyoming now has a has a practice. Act. Um, so, in a clinical survey uh, asking people who've had acupuncture, 
what their experience was, nine out of 10 people said that their uh, major complaint was resolved. That 84% said that they see their MDs less, which is pretty amazing. About 80% have uh, used fewer drugs. 70% have avoided surgery, which is fantastic. You see people feel better most of the time, they work better, their energy level is improved. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they get along better, better with folks. Uh, one of the questions Elena asked was, uh, do acupuncture specialize? And should we ask what the specialization is when we contact an acupuncturist? In China, it's very common to specialize. There are orthopedic specialists, there are pediatricians that only see, uh, only see children, um, uh, podiatrists, et cetera. Um, here in the US, uh, many of us are GPs or general practitioners and that with advanced study in certain areas, we can specialize. And so, um, yeah, and also if you look at people's websites, many times they will say, um, I tend to treat uh, female disorders, um, you know, so they focus on infertility and let's say um, uh, issues with menopause, for instance. Um, you know, I, for the past year, almost two years, I was with Life With Cancer. Um, and so I, you could say I specialized in oncology. However, um, there was such a demand for it here at the hospital that um, I recommended that they get a full-time acupuncturist to just do that because I was splitting my time between that and a Nova well where I So the study of acupuncture, there's roughly 60 schools that are currently accredited. I have candidacy status there, which means that they're candidates for accreditation. And so they're a new school and they're still being scrutinized. Uh, there's currently about 8,000 students who are currently enrolled, and uh, California, Florida, and New York have the most schools. Uh, we have two schools here in Virginia. There are uh, were two schools in Maryland. I think right now there's only one school offering acupuncture in Maryland. So people always ask, well, how does it work? How does it work? typical of, of Americans. And there's different theories, gait theory, circulatory theory, neurotransmitter, endorphins, anti-inflammatory, augment, the augmentation of the, of the immune system. I'm not going to go into detail of these different theories just because uh, unless you're a scientist, you, you, your eyes may roll up in the back of your head. It would be boring. But just like with Einstein, where he was looking for the grand unified theory. He, he wanted to try to connect the very, very small particle physics with the very, very large, which would be um, the, the, the cosmos, the universe. And he was never able to do that. And the same thing is true for acupuncture is that scientists can say, oh, well, someone who has pain that there is a release of endogenous opioids in the brain that reduce the pain. But what about a woman who's not ovulating? Then that would be more on the circulatory theory, which has to do with the endocrine system and how hormones are developed. So even though there's individual theories about different conditions we treat, they really haven't found what the communication is, if someone has a migraine, I can put a needle between their toes and the blood vessels in their brain constrict. Now, how that mechanism is, we don't know, but randomized controlled trials will um, basically study acupuncture as if it were a drug. And I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. So again, I apologize, these numbers are a little bit dated. Uh, there's more than 30,000 studies pertaining to acupuncture and more than 60,000 studies um, uh, pertaining to TCA, traditional Chinese medicine. And NCCIH is part of NIH. It stands for the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. I recently interviewed the director. Her name is Dr. Helene uh, Langevin. She's brilliant, absolutely wonderful. She's really trying to shift to a whole health approach to health and wellness. 
Um, currently, the thing that's the two things missing from healthcare in the United States is health and care. It it seems to me that they don't focus on health. That we tend to be more of a sick care system, and health promotion and disease prevention is kind of minimized. And care, because if physicians are so overwhelmed, I feel that many patients aren't feeling cared for. And uh, I had a friend who recently had COVID and was in the hospital and the nurses, he felt that, that he was well monitored, um, but the care aspect that they were just so overwhelmed that you know the care thing was kind of missing. So a magnetic resonance imagery, most people know what an MRI is. It's a machine that can allow you to look into the body and not only see structural issues like tendons and ligaments and bones breaking, but also chemical type changes in the brain and elsewhere in the body. And what uh, this is is a carpal tunnel patient. And what you can see is that areas of their brain changed when acupuncture was being applied. And this time frame was about a half an hour. So we're not talking about getting the acupuncture treatment and then six weeks later, this is relatively quickly. For those neurologists in the, uh, in, in the audience, this is a summary of the stimulation of a needle and how uh, the brain is affected by it. And the hypothalamus is a basal brain structure, how it communicates to the forebrain and the cerebral cortex, which is the part of our brain that is the thinking part. This is above my pay grade. If you have questions relating to this diagram, I cannot answer it. So interestingly, in infrared, studies or thermographic studies were done, for instance, of neck pain. And you can see that in just less than a half an hour, someone who had quite a bit of inflammation, tightness and pain in their neck was resolved. And the interesting thing is, is that the acupoint bladder 40, so they just used one acupoint, is located on the back of the knee, actually. So as I said before, an RCT is a randomized controlled trial. It's considered the gold standard of research here in, uh, in the US for, uh, for medical research. And typically, uh, well, you may have heard of a double blind placebo controlled study. And an RCT is similar where you have both the patient and the, the doctor blinded that's where the term double blind comes from. And it means that the patient doesn't know if they're getting a placebo, a sugar pill, or the real drug. And the doctor doesn't know if they're giving them a placebo or a real drug. And then they look at the results of the control group versus the group that had the intervention. And the same thing is true for acupuncture where they would needle the real acupuncture point in half of the uh, patients. And then a sham or bogus acupoint, let's say here on um, the rest of the patients and, and they don't know which is the real one and, and which is the, uh, the, the bogus acupoint. And then they find that not, there's a 90% response rate for the people who used the real acupoint and the bogus acupoint may be 30% response rate because placebo effect that happens not only in, in drugs, but also happen in acupuncture as well, um, that about 30% of the people will get better if I were just to randomly throw needles in them without using any kind of acupuncture theory. So um, Dr. Li Xing Lao, is a professor of mine. He had 160 publications when I graduated uh, 20 plus years ago. Very, very impressive man. He also has a PhD and um, 
and he has done some research for NIH. Um, since that time, I now have 200 publications because I wanted to grow up and be just like him. And so uh, Dr. Lau and Dr. Brian Berman from uh, University of Maryland uh, came up with a study where they evaluated a number of subjects with knee osteoarthritis. They used uh, different scales for um, measurement, and they also looked at range of motion, uh, functionality, and, uh, and anti-inflammatory uh, use. And what they found is that it was 88% effective. Objectively, meaning that that's what uh, the doctors saw, and 85% subjectively, which is what the patient felt. So basically nine out of 10 people got better using acupuncture for knee osteoarthritis. People ask, well, what's the difference between uh, Chinese medicine and Western or conventional medicine? And the answer is that Chinese medicine really focuses on the cause. It has very few side effects, which we can discuss. It involves the whole person and it relies on differential diagnosis. Uh, now, again, Western medicine does also rely on differential diagnosis, but it tends to treat the symptom overall. It has serious side effects. There's more than 100,000 deaths per year due to the proper use of medication in the country. And when you start looking at iatrogenic deaths, which are those deaths due to visiting the hospital and getting MRSA, um, uh, mistakes made, unfortunately, in hospital systems and elsewhere, um, post-operative infections, uh, we're talking about um, 350,000 deaths per year. And again, Western medicine has primary specialties and relies primarily on technology, so they're high-tech low touch, and I tend to be low tech, high touch with my patients. There are adverse events in acupuncture and they are well documented and they would include things like bruising at the site of the needling. Uh, you can have people faint due to acupuncture, get lightheaded, although in 20 years, none of my patients have ever fainted, but that is a complaint in the literature. Um, you can also puncture a person's lung, which is called a pneumothorax. And that's very, very rare, but it does happen. Uh, phys uh, physical therapists have been known to puncture people's lungs because they do dry needling, but they don't have the extensive training that I have. Uh, Bonnie asked, is uh, the reaction to a TENS machine similar to acupuncture? So TENS, for those who don't know, is transdermal electroneural stimulation. If you've been to a physical therapist or a chiropractor or other uh, physical medicine folks, they'll take a sticky pad, two of them, an anode and a cathode, and place it on an area of pain and then turn up the volume and you have this electrical stimulation sensation that sends signals to your brain. What happens is your brain attenuates that signal or turns it down in that area of skin that your sensory nerves are in the area of what are called the dermatome, and then you will experience less pain in that area. However, the pain really hasn't been reduced. It's just that your perception of the pain has changed. Also, TENS can be used to contract a muscle and that, if you have a muscle tin spasm, if you were to take a curl and curl a weight, over time, you can't lift that weight anymore and you go to exhaustion. And in a way, that's the way the TENS works, is that it exhausts the muscle and then therefore it stops spasm. So getting back, we do have electroacupuncture where we have very tiny alligator clips that clip the needle, that clip onto the needle and send electricity through it, both in micro volts and in milli, um, sorry, micro amperes and in milli amps. And we have different waveforms from a sine wave to a square wave, et cetera, that we use for different conditions like infertility and also chronic pain. 
So here's a classic uh, Heidelberg study with 60 patients with low back pain that included a disc herniation. And they looked at pain intensity before and after the treatment. And you can see that uh, on a scale of one to 10, where one is barely noticeable and 10 is excruciating, they dropped from almost a six down to a two. So that's pretty good. Radicular pain, ri radicular pain means pains that are radiating, maybe uh, for this from the back, maybe down to the leg, and that also reduced it significantly. And the great thing is, is it's long-term. You can see that three to three months to almost a year after the treatment, 90% of the patients were still happy with the outcome. And I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, so, there's a study done back in 2016, and they had 88,000 practitioner, 88,000 patients of acupuncture practitioners across the nation, and uh, more than 95% of them said that they uh, got better with their condition, and more than 95% said that they would refer their friends or family to their acupuncturist. So that's pretty good. So what is herbology? Herbology is Chinese pharmacology. And back in the 1970s here in the United States, 70% of all drugs were based on some kind of plant. Today, it's more modern and most of our drugs, Allegra, you name it, are synthesized. So there are chemists and pharmacologists that are creating these drugs. If you look to your left, you can see these are raw herbs. And in the classic way we would prescribe, you would bring these home and boil them until uh, the water is reduced by maybe a cup. And then you would pour in more water, continue to boil down, and then you would strain it and that's called a decoction. And it would smell bad and typically taste worse. And this is commonly the way, uh, the way herbal medicine is uh, practiced in China as well. If you look to your right, you can see that there's a lot of herbal medicine that's in the form of granulars, meaning that there's, they create that decoction and they break it down and have a dried substance you mix with hot water, similar to instant coffee. We also have them in a pill form, which sometimes people will call tea pills, and they're quite small. Some of these tea pills are about uh, maybe two to three millimeters in diameter. And uh, we also will physically grind the herbs and then roll them in something that will keep them stuck together. So there's different uh, choices. We also have topical herbs that we use. And uh, that would be for anything from uh, skin conditions to, uh, to musculoskeletal pain. So you can see that we treat a whole host of conditions with herbs that I have cancer on the list. And very few Americans know that, uh, that there are, is herbal medicine that can completely resolve breast cancer, for instance. And you'll say, wow, Bill, how does that work? And the answer is, is that cancer is the, the uncontrolled replication of abnormal cells. And when you have an abnormal cell growth, like a tumor in a breast that's growing, it says, feed me, feed me. And that you'll actually create new blood vessels to feed this growing tumor. There's Chinese medicine that has anti-angiogenic properties, meaning that it blocks your body's ability to produce these blood vessels, and then it chokes off the tumor and the tumors die. There's also herbal medicine that helps make your body more alkaline, and alkaline bodies are much less likely to have cancer than acidic bodies. And you may say, okay, Bill, what's this acid and alkaline thing all about? Well, our standard American diet, which is processed foods, contains a lot of sugar. These are things, meat, these are things that make our bodies uh, acidic. And when our bodies are acidic, it makes for a very, um, 
conducive environment for cancer growth. And you'll notice that when sodas became very popular in the United States, that uh, cancer growth really um, in increased as well. In 1900, there were uh, an average American would consume a pound of sugar in a year. Uh, today, uh, people are consuming more than 100 to 150 pounds of sugar per year. So the foundation of Chinese medicine is qi. And this character is the character for a pot of rice boiling and creating steam, as if the steam that's coming off the rice is qi. And so qi is a central concept in traditional Chinese medicine, and that uh, when you have a blockage or stagnation of qi, that can cause pain or can cause some kind of disruption. And uh, someone asked, am I gonna talk about mox and cupping? The answer is absolutely. That's definitely part of um, our skill set and things that we use regularly. There are 361 acupuncture points on the body. They're bilaterally symmetric, so like a mirror image. So I'm saying just one side is 361 points. So in theory, if you're looking at a body, there's more than, you can say 800 acupuncture points on the body that we get to choose from. Uh, there's also 109 acupuncture points in the ear alone, and that has a special system called the auricular acupuncture, and that's quite powerful. Up until 1950, there was no proof that these meridians or pathways of energy existed. And the same thing is true for the acupoints. They were ancient Chinese in the literature, uh, but uh, scientists got very in interested and a Japanese scientist uh, injected a, radio a radioactive isotope into acupuncture points. And lo and behold, the fluid ran right along the pathway of energy and when they inject it just into a, a non-acupuncture point, it just diffused into the local tissue area. So kind of interesting. And then they found out electrical engineers were really interested. And so they um, touched the skin and found that when the, the measuring device landed right on an acupoint, uh, there was a drop of impedance or electrical resistance. So we know that there's some kind of impedance going on as well. DN stones, before there were needles that, um, that these practitioners would stimulate acupoints on the body using a pointy stone, but not actually penetrating the skin. A kind of more acupressure. Guasa is a scraping instrument that's used. You can see the different types of instruments. Sometimes they use a horn of an animal. Sometimes they use jade. This here is from the uh, horn of a buffalo. And you can see these scraping marks. There was a young boy who had um, a cold and his Chinese parents did guasa on his back, which stimulates certain interleukins, which help with uh, recovery of a cold. And the child went to school and he was in the playground and he was hanging upside down and his shirt lifted up. And the teacher saw his back and called the police. And the parents had to come in and talk to the police and say, no, this is not child abuse. This is guasa. This is an actual technique that's used. Moxibustion, moxa, is also known as uh, Artemisia vulgaris or mugwort, and it is an herb that you can see can be burned at the ends of needles. It can also be used in a stick form, getting close. Let's say this person has tennis elbow, for instance. It can help with tendonitis. It can help with a whole host of conditions. If a woman has a mal-positioned fetus, if a baby is feet first, you can use moxa on bladder 67, which is an acupoint on the side of a pinky toe, and 99% of the time, the fetus will rotate head down in order to be born properly. 
cupping has become very popularized in the recent um, Olympics. And you've seen uh, Michael Phelps having cupping marks on his body. And it's funny that the, that the, uh, the announcers will say, oh, these people are doing uh, this cupping, but there's no scientific support that it works. Well, they're absolutely wrong. Uh, there are more than 200 studies at the National Institutes of Health, the National Library of Medicine that show how cupping works. And uh, they just, they should do their homework rather. They should engage this before they engage this. But anyway, you can see that the person to the left definitely has shoulder problems. It could be uh, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. It could be um, maybe a um, some kind of rotator cuff injury. And the common muscle in the rotator cuff is the, uh, uh, the supraspinatus muscle, which can get torn and cause pain. Uh, to your right, this person could be uh, suffering from fatigue and but putting these cups along the, the back will help stimulate the nerves and get them to uh, have greater energy. Um, you can also move the cup. And if you have he adhesions, which is connective tissue that's stuck together, you can move and pull apart that, that connective tissue that's stuck together and, and then you will feel better. Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have about 17 minutes to go. Just to Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm nearing the end of this. Oh, as a matter of fact, this is the last slide. And this just shows the Shar Cancer Center, which my uh, building is across the street from. So if I were standing looking from my building, this is, uh, is what you'd see. Uh, my building is located at 8100 Innovation Park Drive. Uh, the phone number beneath it is a way that you could call to get an appointment. Um, I hate to say it, but my next new patient uh, appointment would be in late December or maybe early January because, um, you know, uh, acupuncture is popular. You know, there's, um, there's just a, a great uh, demand for it. And um, there, luckily, there is, um, I'll write down in the uh, the chat, a place that you can go to look for an acupuncturist. It's www.nccaom.org. That stands for the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. And from there, you would click on Find a Practitioner. And then it would request a zip code and you could put in your zip code and then a radius, five miles, 10 miles, et cetera. And then it'll give a list of all the acupuncturists that are in your area. In Virginia, we have about 370 acupuncturists. In Maryland, there's more than a thousand because there were more schools in Maryland and there were some uh, constraints on how we could practice years ago that has since changed. In California, there are 8,000 acupuncturists because it's quite a large state and there's multiple schools there and there's also quite a large Asian community. I assumed that when I, practiced, when I studied acupuncture that I would be one of the few Americans in the room and I was absolutely wrong. And out of 30 people in my class, um, 26 of us were Americans, and then there are four Asians, one Japanese, uh, two Chinese, and a, and a Korean. So with that being said, now I can open it up to questions, and I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions you have specific to conditions that you have, or any family members. Uh, Gloria, please. I'd like to know more about the um, osteoarthritis uh, with acupuncture. Does it actually slow the process down or is it just for pain? That's a great question. If all I did was palliative care, I would throw away my needles and find a different profession. Uh, luckily for, 
for osteoarthritis, which is defined as the gradual deterioration of articular cartilage. And so the cartilage in our bodies tend to break down. And what acupuncture does that stimulates chondrocyte production, which helps the cartilage rebuild itself. There's also some Western medical techniques, one that's called PRP, which is platelet-rich prolotherapy, and some stem cell technologies that will also do the same and stimulate uh, the uh, cartilage production. One of the huge things you can do is uh, hydrate, that um, you should have at least 50% uh, of your weight in ounces of water. So if I tip the scales at 150 pounds, then 75 ounces of water per day would be appropriate. Secondly, there's a product called Baxyl, B-A-X-Y-L. I'll put this in the messenger. Made by uh, Cogent Solutions. And uh, Baxil is hyaluronic acid. It's the stuff that makes our, our cartilage hydrophilic or like water. And um, it's amazing and uh, also stimulates uh, cartilage production throughout the body. Um, Alice asked, well, how often are herbs used with acupuncture? And in some states, it's required to study herbs with acupuncture, like in California. In other states like Virginia, it's optional. And so um, the practitioners vary. Um, if you see OMD after a person's name, um, then typically they do herbs as well. You can see CH, which means that they uh, are certified in herbology or Chinese pharmacology. So it just uh, depends. So um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, so the other question you may ask is, well, how long does it take? And if you came in and said, uh, my knee has been troubling me for, uh, for 10 years, I would say twice a week for three weeks and then drop down to once per week for a while. And it would take months to treat knee osteoarthritis to the point where um, you're walking normally and feeling great. Uh, Lillian, you have a question? Yeah. Um... This was the first time I heard anyone uh, characterize IBS as an autoimmune disease. Um, okay. I've, uh, um, I, I've never heard that before. Um, and uh, my question is, um, are you saying that it cannot be treated by, in your estimation, it can't be treated by um, acupuncture until uh, the bacterial issue gets taken care of? And the test, I've also never heard of, a, of the um, urine test you mentioned. Okay, the lactulose mannitol. And most physicians haven't heard of that test. Do you, do you do that test or does a physician do it? A, a physician would, but they would have to go to specific laboratories that offer that test. Uh, and and yeah. that would indicate that you have leaky gut, that you have hyperpermeability of your small intestine, and that that would lead to the IBS. So even things like rheumatoid arthritis can be an autoimmune disorder caused by a weakness in your small intestine. And that glyphosate, which is found in Roundup, punches holes in our small intestine and are causing these problems. There's a researcher at uh, MIT, her name is Dr. Stephanie Seneff, and she's brilliant. And she made the direct connection between uh, glyphosate and, uh, and autoimmune disorders. And I spoke at a national conference with Deepak Chopra and others. And that was my topic was, um, was leaky gut syndrome and all of the different conditions that leaky gut can cause, which include IBS and rheumatoid arthritis and food allergies and a whole host of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, lupus and uh, Hashimoto. Hashimoto's thyroiditis and things that were fairly rare 20 years ago and now are pretty ubiquitous, unfortunately. So in uh, other words, you have to get treated for those things before you can go to acupuncture. Is that what you're um, saying? So I'm saying that acupuncture alone can improve your condition. Um, but if, if I certainly would want to know if there's that component and mm -hmm. if so, then I would address that as well. And you just get much better outcomes. That's all. So acupuncture alone can be helpful. 
Uh, someone asked, does insurance pay for this? And the answer is, it, it's not whether I accept uh, you, it's whether your insurance accepts me. And so someone can say, oh, I have Blue Cross Blue Shield. Will it cover acupuncture? The answer is, well, if you're, if you work at a, a, a an organization that is uh, generous, then you'll have full medical, full dental, full vision acupuncture coverage it, through Blue Cross Blue Shield. Then you can work for a small mom and pops company where they're they're a little bit stingy, and they'll just um, cover uh, dental cleanings, no acupuncture, no vision, etc. So that's it. Did that answer your question, Lillian? Uh, I'm about, I didn't ask the insurance question. I asked the other, I guess. No, I, I'm no, a little, I understand that. that yeah, I'm, I'm just, yeah, it, it's confusing to me because this is the first time I'm hearing this and I guess I need to do some more research, but um, I just, um, I just never heard that before. And, um, you know, I uh, always heard that it was, you know, could be stress or diet or whatever, but not not that it's an autoimmune. Um, yeah, and if you if you Google uh, IBS and leaky gut and and look, then you'll see the direct connection. I just did that, and I didn't find it. <laughs> so I'm. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I guess I have to do a little bit more research on um, on that. Thank you, though. Sure. I'm going to answer a few chat questions, then I'll move on to Bonnie. Um, does NCCOM allow one to determine how extensive a practitioner's experience is in treating a particular disease? The answer is unfortunately no. They're just the certification commission, so they're just... Um, they just create the tests to say that we're competent when we graduate. If you don't pass the test, you don't get licensed. Um, however, um, on their website, there's two find a practitioner. One of them uh, actually will tell you when they were certified, which would give you an idea how many years experience they have. So, you know, if they're certified in 2019, oops, you know, two years, not so great. Um, you know, you see they're certified in 1995. Well, okay, you've got a pretty seasoned uh, practitioner there. So at least that can be helpful for you. Um, but they don't indicate like, what school they went to. And there's some schools that are really highly um, recognized, like my school, Maryland Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine, uh, PCOM, Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. There's, there's a school up in New England called New England School of, of Traditional Chinese Medicine that's really quite impressive. And they have amazing uh, teachers. And I used to teach uh, both at uh, Georgetown Medical School and also at Virginia University of Integrative Medicine. But I realize that advocacy is more important. And so I'm, I'm working towards an integrated healthcare system. Uh, so uh, Jeffrey asked, is gluten sensitivity treatable by acupuncture? Um, there is uh, something called NAET, and I'll put that in, it's, it stands for Nambudrapod Allergy Elimination Technique. And that's something that can, in fact, completely resolve uh, gluten intolerance. It can also help with any kind of allergies you have to environmental allergies, like dust and mold and uh, hay fever and um, also um, internal things like uh, if you're allergic to peanuts and uh, or catnip. Uh, so definitely I would look for NAET.com and they have a list of practitioners there and they could help you out. Okay, uh, Bonnie, I appreciate you being patient and uh, I'm ready to answer your question. May I ask two questions? Um, just off this subject, but is, is acupuncture at all helpful for um, strengthening bone density? Oh, that's a brilliant question. And so I was going to speak at uh, an aerospace uh, uh, medicine com conference last year, but it got canceled. And the title of my presentation was Acupuncturist Wanted for Mission to Mars. And I was talking about how when you're in a microgravity environment, there's certain things that happen, including your, your equilibrium fluid floating, which makes you not feel so well. 
um, that uh, you, people will have uh, uh, issues with um, uh, with GI stuff. And one of the big things is um, is osteopenia or osteoporosis that in space uh, you, that your bones actually be weakened. And so acupuncture can stimulate uh, bone regrowth. But uh, a product that I recommend very highly is called Bone Builder, and I'll put this in here. And uh, it's uh, by Metagenics. And it has calcium, magnesium, and boron, and silica, and all the basic building blocks of bone. And that can uh, improve density of bone without, um, without a drug. Uh, yeah, um, boron's really not good though for uh, people who've had cancer, from what I gather. Yeah, that's a that's a valid point, and uh, there's some people where zinc can be a problem as well. Um, so it, you know, definitely speak to your your oncologist or your doctor if uh, before trying mm -hmm. some supplement. On the other question with the osteoarthritis, um, yeah, I've had both knee replacements now, and. Um, I have had PRP and stem cell before, which worked really well for my neck. I had a bone spur in my neck uh -huh. and PRP followed by stem cell kind of did away with that. So I'm kind of concerned about the Vaxel um, stimulating cartilage production could cause osteophytes or bone spurs. Aren't they this kind of the same thing? Uh, absolutely not. And no. that uh, no, that the bone spur is is hypertrophic bone production, and that Vaxel uh, doesn't really uh, produce any bone. It, it only produces cartilage, and it won't grow cartilage out of control. Like suddenly your nose won't be you know won't be three times larger, even <laughs> though you know there's cartilage in our nose. It, uh -huh. It's just the, the areas of deterioration in your body, like your spine uh, or your knees or your shoulder cartilage will, will regrow. Oh, thank you. That is so helpful. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here for you. Uh, Tina, you have a question? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Tina in disguise. That's my wife. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the negative effects of acupuncture? You did mention the rare case of lung puncture, uh, yes. but more commonly, what are the negative side effects? That's that's a great question. I appreciate you picking that up. And that uh, here in the United States, the number of deaths due to acupuncture in the past 50 years has been a total of zero. So uh, it really, and it doesn't mean that you can't kill someone with acupuncture. If you are incredibly incompetent, you actually can. And that in China, there are a few instances where people had their brain stem penetrated with an acupuncture needle and the brain lead eventually led to death. Um, as far as uh, some of the, the adverse events associated, I should back up a little. The average MD pays about $60,000 for malpractice insurance. If they're in a specialty like OB, it can be 160,000 annually. I pay $75 a month for malpractice insurance. And so malpractice insurance is really proportional to the number of malpractice suits that you get, the number of people you hurt. And so acupuncture is extremely safe. It is equivalent to massage therapy. And some massage therapists will stretch a person's arm and potentially tear a, a tendon. Um, well, we don't really do that, but um, we, um, so there's something called uh, cardiac uh, tamponade, and that is where a needle is punctured through the chest. There's, there's an acupoint here that in some people, there's a genetic abnormality and there's an opening between uh, their, their sternum and, and their xiphoid process. And if you stick a needle straight through there, you can puncture the uh, pericardium, the, the sac surrounding the, the heart. And, and that is problematic. Um, Thank you very much for that. Just a quick follow-up. I really wasn't um, thinking so much about the about the catastrophic uh, effects. I think much, much more subtle, for example, energy level, 
uh, that type of thing. I'm taking a beta blocker. I wonder if, you know, if I could get off that. Uh, well, is there any, you know, corresponding type of risk, something of that nature, not, not death or, or serious injury. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so some of the common issues, um, usually, um, the side effects of acupuncture include, uh, better sleep, um, better digestion, um, feeling calmer and less anxious. Um, as far as just little things that happen, there's bruising at the site of needling. A cupping will leave bruises for uh, for several days or longer. Um, Guasa, of course, you saw pictures that that looks pretty heinous, um, and, and that what people recover from, obviously. Um, uh, sometimes people will feel a little fatigue after the treatment. Uh, they want to take a nap afterwards um, because they're so relaxed. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I have one patient that was odd that she had an allergy to stainless steel and that, uh, you know, she would have a little histamine reaction at the point of needling. Oh, an infection. That there is a possibility of, of an infection at the it, site of insertion, but we sterilize the points before we insert them. And I've been practicing for 20 years and have not had one uh, infection associated with acupuncture. Thank you very much. Hope you come back. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, any any other questions? I know that we're nearing the end, and I don't want to violate are, that. We are over time. It's, oh my! Okay, that's okay. Well, I, I I I really really want to thank you <laughs> on behalf of Oli and everybody who uh, were attending presentation uh, because it's really really informative. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, oh, if oh, if you oh. want to to do some final words, go ahead. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Uh, so, so definitely uh, don't hesitate for those of you who uh, are out of Virginia to look online and find an acupuncturist. And that um, you can also ask your friends, you'd be surprised that there are quite a few people who have had acupuncture, but just don't really mention it because it sounds a little odd and, and they think that people will, will um, uh, you know, judge them. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're sweeping across the nation. There's uh, there's there's about 38,000 of us practicing in the country, and uh, it's used at 91% of the uh, VA hospitals in the country, and there's 1,200 of them. And so we're growing, and I expect that we'll continue to grow. In oncology, uh, we're used at all the best oncology uh, programs in the country, like MD Anderson, et cetera. So that's my story, and uh, and thanks for coming and enjoying the. Uh, the presentation.